to our fourth chat with the champions. I'm Adam from Out Ahead. That's my sidekick Dave there wearing the stick on beard mask and it makes him look 87 years old. And we've got a very young rider with us today. That's Graham Jarvis. Now, I think it's fair to say, Graham, you're probably most famous for jumping your motorbike on a shed. Is that about right? Yeah, that's the problem, isn't it? <laughs> Get winning races. I'm, the, I'm just the guy that fell through the shed. <laughs> so did he want to destroy that shed? Was that the plan? Was well, it... yeah, I was weighing it up. We'd done a few videos and uh, you've got to take it to the next level, haven't you? So I thought, you know, I thought there might have been half a chance the shed would hold up, but I don't think it, it had much of a chance. But it wasn't, wasn't just to try and get some sponsorship from B&Q or something like that, or Wix or something. Yeah, I had some uh, offers for a new shed. So we've, we've got a new shed now, free of charge. The only thing that was happening there was Graham was looking at his Instagram account going down and his engagement. And he went, what am I going to do next? And then it was already called on, wasn't it? Like you, you did the, you, you, you slowly built up and then all of a sudden you dropped that one in. And I think there was one in the kitchen as well, where you were just lighting up the back wheel. And then you, and then that was it, wasn't it? It was like, you went, then you've gone. Yeah. It was all good. It kept I the it, it worked a treat though, Graham, didn't it? Because at the end of the day, like you know, everybody was watching it, weren't they? And they're all they're all raving about it. Yeah, we did the trip. We're on a million followers now, so that all helped. My youngest see that um, earlier today. He did say he said, "Dad, he's got a um, he's got a million followers." I was like, "Yeah, I know." He's just I said he was on ninety nine. Was it nine 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 the other the other day when I looked? Yeah. It's only just gone up, hasn't it? Yeah, that's it. It's uh, last few weeks has been good. We've been, I've just been putting out some old videos, which are going well. <laughs> Run out of content. <laughs> just doing the repost. So how does it feel to be one of Britain's most well-known motorcyclists on social media? You, you're the man. Age. At my they're age, it's crazy. They're going to ask you on Strictly Come Dancing next or something, or like the YouTube. Yeah. What that... am I thinking at my age? It's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> 46 in April and still riding motorbikes. But was that always Heard a plan? Thought. Was always a plan to be right? This YouTube and Instagram, I'm going to be the big, the big YouTube, the big YouTube Instagram man. Yeah, so there was no, there was no plan when I finished the trials. Hard enduro wasn't really a sport, a career move, and there wasn't the YouTube then either. <laughs> so none of it was planned. The sport's grown, hasn't it? And the social media and so. Nobody could ever predict the way it's gone, but it's all turned out good. You you was quite early on YouTube though, weren't you, Graham? If I remember rightly? Uh yeah, the Facebook was uh first. I started just starting doing a few videos and then you know realized that was that was the way. It was actually the adventure spec guys that kind of made me realize that you know we need to be doing it a little bit more properly and uh do some decent YouTube videos as well. Yeah, the, the skate park one and the one in Spain. You know, looking back at them now, they're not the, not the best videos, but at the time, people went crazy for them. So it all helped to give me the boost. Yeah. Do, do you think your amazing success at that has actually changed the sport, the sport that you do? Because now some of these events have got you, you know, climbing up through buildings on stairwells and doing stuff that, was never part of enduro really for ever was it you know it was rocks and streams yeah that's it. i'd like to think uh, i helped build the sport a little bit people do say you know they often message saying you know that's the reason they saw me and then they took up the sport and it's pretty cool and even now people older guys as well saying it's kind of i motivate them inspire them to keep riding or take up the sport so it's that's pretty cool are you, are you saying, well, that the age bracket has shifted, hasn't it, anyway, within motorbikes, right? So as in, so we all know that later on now, that, you know, the older guys who used to have the bikes or didn't have the bikes and wanted the bikes, they seem to be uh, dominating the market and the youngsters don't seem to be coming through or the, the sales don't seem to be uh, on par, let's say. So, um, so, yeah, I like that, Graham. You just took credit for that, didn't you? Yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> but go on, what, what was, I mean, obviously, I was, where I was going with my boy as well. You know, do you remember going running with him, Graham? 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah. And like here's- And I kept up, yeah. even with my knees. <laughs> but, but you don't do much physical training, do you? Yeah, I try and do a bit, but uh, riding the bike's the best thing, isn't it? It's the most fun and, uh, but yeah, trying to keep on top of the aches and pains. Well, that's bodies. That's- that's yeah, where yeah. I was kind of going with it. I know that, I mean, the secret, you know, I was kind of trying to think of, you know, when you're getting older, you know, you know, what is, what is the best way to, to obviously to carry on and to, to prolong the, the kind of riding. And I, I know that you, you know, you, you were one for riding the bike, you know, quite a lot, most days, you know, I suppose the question is how many times a week do you ride the bike? Um, I suppose you have to ride it a lot because of the schools, the amount of schools, but we'll get on to that you do, but we'll get on to that, you know, in a bit. But I suppose the question is, is that how many times a week do you ride a bike? Um, and also as well, um, I do believe that you've changed your diet as well, which could be a little bit, could be a little yeah, bit. Yeah, well, it, it, I was getting a little bit of a, a belly, so I had to change something. You know, if you want good, I had to breathe in for all the photos. So, you know, <laughs> no, we, had to change the, <laughs> we had to change the diet a little bit before it got out of control. So, yeah, I, I kind of eat a little bit less red meat and stuff and, uh, you know, more just try and stay healthy, stay off the, the desserts and the junk food. But, uh, yeah, the training, you know, got to train hard, three or four times a week riding and then, you know, I do a little bit of physical training in the gym and that as well. You know, keep on top of the the injuries. And uh, but the biggest, the hardest things, the recovery. You've just got to, as you get older, I think it's hard to do back to back days to go flat out every day. You've got to rest up sometimes and plan the training a bit more. Yeah, I mean, what your career is. Like, go on, sorry, Adam. So your, it's career is almost in reverse, though. Like you started out doing trials, which is obviously reasonably slow and picking your lines then he did a bit of kind of kind of time and observation like scott trial then into enduro so you're kind of going faster and more risky as you get older right are you, are you going to keep on going until you're doing sort of dakar and motor gp or are you going to kind of eventually end up back on the trials bike well that's it i need i need another career now don't i for the next 10 years what what can i do <laughs> you've got that haven't you? you know it isn't and that's already getting mapped out by the looks of it. You've got a new yeah. team. Yeah, that's it. But, uh, you know, we're trying to pass on the knowledge, build something to, to, to carry on, and uh, hopefully I'll keep riding for a few more years. It depends if I want to keep racing, even when I'm not winning is probably the question, isn't it? If I still enjoy it, and I think I'd, I'd still like to, to go racing, even if I didn't have a real chance of winning, probably could be more fun in some ways a little bit less pressure try and help the team ride with them guys practice with them guys help them yeah. and get the jarvis yeah. name back on the podium of the next generation <laughs> oh, i can see yeah i can see it i can see it all unfolding now they'll be in <laughs> to be honest um the guys that you've got i've been having a little look at them across the board they i mean they look pretty. They look pretty handy, Graham. To be fair, I think you better watch out. Yeah, they're all. You know, they're all nearly there. So you got the factory guys, and then the amateur guys, and bridging that gaps. Kind of what the plan is, because for the amateur guys, you know, there's no real help for them. And I know that feeling. I know that how that is. It's difficult to to take it to the next level. So, you know, if we can get them organised, there's not big money involved, but organisation training and that I'll help them with the training and uh, obviously any way I can and uh, but the guys have all got the skill you know it's there it just needs that extra little bit of help to get them up to the factory riders competing with them guys. I, mean, I look at you when I see videos of you in, in, in competitions it, it's your trial skills that amazing balance and finding grip where no one else does seems to me to be your advantage over the other guys. Do you do you focus? Is that what you're going to focus on with the with, with your new team? Is it kind of actually go slow, learn, learn all that sort of stuff before you go fast, or or do, is it all individual? Yeah, I think every rider's got the the strengths and weaknesses. So you know, just try and help them with whatever they need. 
but you know, it's it's just at the end of the day, the guy's got to be hungry for it, dedicated. I think whatever you do, if they're hungry enough, they're going to make it happen. Graham, just then you said about um, you know what it's like, or you can relate to um, you know the struggle, um, you know, or, or or lack of support. Let's say, yeah, when you're kind of coming through. So, um, do you want to? Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Do you want to come on? What, what yeah, I could tell you tell you about all my hardships um, to get to the top. <laughs> yeah, I want to, we want to know. I mean, I mean, look, yeah, I can I can fill in a, a few of the gaps for because I've seen you know we've I, I I know a little bit about your background. So obviously I know that you used to have a BMX or was out in the you know you know out in the streets and smashing up your garden pretty much with obstacle courses in your garden with 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 your bike. So actually, when I see all of your stuff that you did. Um, with your motorbike outside it was almost like you was reliving your youth so yeah it was exactly you, yeah you that it's, was that was nothing new for that was nothing new for you that was just you repeating history wasn't it, really but yeah but but you just but you just said then about you know one of the reasons about the team so I, i'm interested so come on let's see your hardships what what was the you know well it's probably you know it started off with the trials i was kind of the schoolboy champion so I kind of thought I was I was the man a little bit, but uh, you know that step up to the world championship. It was four or five years of just struggling and uh, not making it, and uh, you know it's it was a point where you, you just don't know if you want to carry on. Is it worth it? Are you going to make it? Is it a waste of time? So and getting that help is is really difficult. And then uh, when I changed to Endura as well. You know, there wasn't a lot of help there. I was, I've done a couple of years at Romaniacs where I've kind of been on my own. One year I was actually riding and then working on my bike afterwards. So, you know, it's good to actually do that, I think. So you appreciate the factory ride when you get it. So, but... Uh, you don't have yeah, to clean the bike yet, though. <laughs> yeah, I try and avoid that. any working on the bike now. <laughs> I think I've earned that privilege. <laughs> But uh, yes. yeah, what what it's, you know when so let's say so when you went into enduro, um, you know or extreme enduro, me and Adam was having this conversation earlier. We're we're kind of a little bit um, we're a little bit green, you know, to um, how it's working. You know, time card, British enduro, world enduro, extreme enduro, uh, the indoor enduro. I, I you know. You, you, you basically are just um, like extreme enduro, is that correct, mainly? Yeah, that's it. I, when I first came to enduro, I, I did actually did a world championship, you know, the time card stuff, some British rounds, uh, helped me get my speed up. And, uh, you know, you need a certain amount of speed, but you don't need to be super fast. But, uh, you know, it was enough. I'm, I'm good enough on the fast stuff now. I'm not the best, but I'm good enough. <laughs> and uh, so, so when you when did like when did it change for you? You know, but when did what like you, you're in? So you're you're out there on your own. You know, you're doing everything yourself. When what was the what was the changing point? Or when? Yeah, so the the uh, Italian team picked me up. It's it is still a, a private team, but uh, you know they they uh, were professional, and that was kind of the turning point. To have them guys backing me and then that quickly turned into a factory ride so it kind of grew as a sport grew as well because you know the factory weren't wasn't supporting the the races anyway back then really so you know it i kind of just progressed with the sport and uh when it's it's the sports just obviously keeps growing doesn't it and the level of riding everyone's developing the bikes training harder it's becoming more professional. We've got the FIM championship now, so it's going to be an official championship. So, go on, Adam. I know you've got. Some. I just just talking about you know, so you you've got your time card enduros. Then those are some of the the traditional enduros, long stages, special tests, and that's kind of the world enduro championship is is like that, right? And then you've got the super enduro. World Championship. That's the indoor one, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. So when it, it's the early days of hard injury, you had the likes of NITA. He was doing everything, but as it's become more professional, it's become more specialised and 
people kind of uh, stick to the, their own discipline. A few guys do the super enduro and the hard enduros, but uh, yeah, it's kind of becoming more specialised and you've got to... And your specialty is the, the hard enduros, which is like Rumaniacs, Erzberg, those sorts of... Yeah, that's it. I did a bit, a little bit of super enduro as well, uh, like seven, eight years ago. So that was good experience, but especially at my age, it's hard to do too many things. So I'd really try and focus on the races that I really want to win, the biggest races. Because I mean, those super enduros look intense. The enduro ones, they look like an enduro version of supercross. That yeah, kind of that's it. Kind of it's gone, uh, the level's gone crazy and it's so fast now. And it's uh, got to be real aggressive in it as well, which is not my speciality but you know I prefer the outdoors riding on my own and I'm not too keen bashing bars with other people <laughs> in your opinion, we have to do it on at the Erzberg but come on Graham in your opinion then which is the what's the best event what is the best event for, for, for you for you or just for the sport in general yeah the biggest is Erzberg it's, it's uh, probably way ahead of everything else the live tv and you know the following for that race is huge. And then Romaniacs, completely two different styles of race. Romaniacs is probably, you know, more appealing for your amateur riders to have a go at because it's got, you've got five classes. Erzberg's just one track. So unless you've got a, a certain level, you're probably going to be stuck pretty near the start line <laughs> if you I mean, qualify. <laughs> I mean, things like Erzberg, the course is often ridiculously hard isn't it isn't, haven't they're, they been all, they're all ridiculously hard <laughs> they've been making all, it easier aren't they? yeah that's it they keep uh yeah it's Berg, they just keep i've seen it progress 10 years ago how the tracks just got harder and harder and harder more intense and it's uh but the bikes are developed as well the tires and and the riders techniques uh they're, they're having to put more stuff in to stop us. Are you, uh, was that one year there was like a few of you had to help each other to the finish line, wasn't that? Was that was that Erzberg? Yeah, so the, the the thing there was that nobody had ridden the track, so they didn't even know if it was possible, and it turned out it was actually impossible. So, and we didn't, you know, we walked bits of the track, and nobody had seen that, so we did, couldn't kick a line in or you know pick a line, and we just got there, and you know, in the end, we had to help each other, but. People remember that. It's a bit of a strange situation, but people still talk about it. So, you know, there's always strange things happening in our sport. Didn't you, feel like, didn't you feel like going, yeah, yeah, we'll all help each other. And then at the last sort of 50 yards, kind of go, oh, and just, you know, just push the other down the hill a bit and you take off and take the glory. Yeah, that's it, isn't it? But, you know, we're all, uh, it's a friendly sport. We're all friends. We all go for a beer after. and. It's uh, respect for each other. So if you say something, you do it. You don't. You all go That's for a beer after. Who buys the rounds then? Because let's be honest, well, you and your yeah. boys are pretty tight, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, that's it. I live in Yorkshire now, so I'm last to the bar. Graham, <laughs> 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 no. right? You, it's one of the things then what I just picked up on what you, what you mentioned um, was tyres. So I remember you asking me before about tyres. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, uh, in my opinion, you know, look, you've got like the, the kind of top of the range tyres, like let's say three or four brands, which I would always class as being quite similar. Um, but actually, um, in the enduro world, it seems like mooses, inner tubes, tyres is such a massive minefield. Um, without kind of touching too much on it, you know, what what's your kind of opinion on, on the tyres and you know, what do you kind of, what do you prefer, obviously, you know, regarding in terms of setup? Yeah, like you say, the tyres are really important. The moose is real soft. It can, it's probably the most important thing to get right on the bike. But uh, yeah, like 10 years ago, there was only a couple of manufacturers doing the soft tyres, especially for the hard enduros. But now everyone's jumped on it. You know, they're all trying to make a good tyre and, they are progressing all the time. You know, they all look pretty similar, but some are just so much better than others. Uh, but you've still got to get the, your mooses right in that, and there's no real exact science to it. It's hard to get 
everyone exactly the same how you want it. So, but you've got to have the, the soft mousse, soft grippy tire, and away you go. You need all the help you can get. I suppose that's because I mean that when it comes to the technical sections, it's fair to say that you you know you do seem to excel there, don't you? That's you're making up a pot. You seem to make up most of your time in in that area. So you've obviously got something that works quite well. Probably want to keep it a little bit secret to yourself, eh? But yeah, that's it. I don't want to give everything away. No, but, but, uh, but I mean that. I mean obviously that comes down to you as a rider feeling. Yeah, having a feel for that though, no? Eh? In terms of your suspension set up and things you know um, and along them lines because your bike does seem to look um quite a lot softer uh than most when you watch you know when you watch you ride it um but that's kind of your style as well isn't it you, you know how you approach things and attack things um so yeah it does it does seem that i don't know is that the case you know between like you know when you're doing tests when you're doing tests across the board with other riders you have a teammate. Is your setup a little bit different? Yeah, I think I think we've uh, we kind of go different directions. Sometimes we all have the same choices between the factory riders, but uh, I think mine's quite a little bit different to everyone else's. Different style of riding, but uh, you know you've got to <coughs> you've got to put the, do the testing as well now, which is kind of a, I'm not a fan of too much testing. Back in the day, we used to just take a standard bike, go out and ride. It was no, but uh, you know, it's all a bit more work in it doing the testing. But it's got to be done. How, how different is your is your your factory bike to like a standard, you know, Husqvarna Enduro bike? I mean, the motocross yeah. guys, you know, Caroli hurling these bikes with their massive suspension and coil springs and. Is it a lot different on yours? Yeah, it's not a huge difference, but we we obviously just trying to get every little edge that we can, every advantage we can. So just suspension, you know, engine a little bit, mappings and stuff. There's a few different options, but uh, nothing crazy. We don't have anything crazy expensive bikes, with too many specially made parts. <laughs> Well, um, what's next then, Grant? You know, come on. So you've, you've signed, you've signed for another year now, haven't you? Is that right? Yeah, oh, that's yeah. it. One more year. They wouldn't take me on for longer than a year for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> but they said that but five it. years ago. <laughs> yeah, that's it. They're not confident I can do more than one year. It's a <laughs> bit of a shame. <laughs> but um, yeah, we've so we've got the, the team involved as well. The factory are supporting that, so that's all part of the deal. And. Uh, yeah, one more year. See what happens. Yeah, you know, honestly, I don't know how I feel in, in another year's time. It's hard to know how I feel how the result's going to be. So, uh, you know, it's sensible to do one year at a time and uh, see what happens. But uh, we've got the, you know, just trying to set a few things up as well. We've got the Jarvis Sinker Tours. So we've got four countries we've got Spain, Panama, Wales, sunny Wales, and uh, Turkey. So, the idea it's not good at the moment with the pandemic but you know the idea is people give people options to go to different countries they've got the good bikes husvanas all husvanas and they get the jarvis signature trails for all levels what what's the Easy, situation extreme. yeah so what so what happens there is that so you know is that set up just for like people within them countries or like can i come along and just go you know abroad what what how, you know what is what's the deal yeah, so the idea is to get people to give people the opportunity to travel, you know, all around the world, and because uh, you know it's some a lot of countries, you know, we have bad weather, don't we, in the UK, and it's difficult to ride. So it's we're always focused on places that are more open to ride, sunshine, and uh, all round experience. So a little bit of teaching as well, learning a, a few techniques, hit some trails, and uh, see the country and have a good time so it's always a good mix of uh, the whole experience it's, it's, a, yeah, it's a good riding holiday but you are you up you're not at all of them now are you you've got some different people right no that's it i'll go to you know the different countries when i can fit it in and then we'll have certified trainers at each one you know make sure that they're, they're, they're a good level of rider and they can pass on a little a few tips and stuff and uh the key is always to have trails for all the abilities so you know 
so you can cater for everybody just start in the sport easy trails and then obviously the the real challenge in the stuff as well which is becoming more popular you can just come along and smash one of my bikes up it's no problem well, you've seen me <laughs> send it into the trees though, haven't you? i might just come along to one of them and do the same well, you, you've got some talent. I've seen it. It's there. We just need to nurture it a little bit. You might get a place on the team if you keep working. I'm still young enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there a vet class in the uh, in extreme championships? <laughs> no, nah, there should be a special class, really, shouldn't there? But uh, well, you, yeah. you got you, you silver class, haven't you? So we've got we've got Grant Churchwood on the team. He's he's going to be aiming for the the silver class so you know trying to help him out as well he's doing the signature tours in wales as well yeah, i mean graham you, you've ridden a lot of places over the world around the world um and just sound like a lot of the motocross guys have but they tend to go airport you know hotel paddock race home whereas at least with your enduro you know like your six days enduros and things like that you seem to seem to just have a bit more fun and see more of the country and ride in some awesome places what What's been your favourite, your, you know, great motorcycling experience? Not necessarily a race you've won, you know, just that kind of pinch yourself and go, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, well, it's incredible how many countries hard enduro is taking off. So, you know, random countries that, they're, you know, you can see some, obviously we're riding longer distances, aren't we? So you get to see a bit more of the country and quite often you get to see, obviously, the real country as well, not just a holiday resort. <laughs> So it's really cool experience. I love doing the, the schools and stuff and riding different places. You know, you're not under any pressure, aren't you? The races and that's a bit more of a job in it. So, you know, you're there to, to do a job and you, you, walk, you tend to fly in, walk the track, do your race and fly out. So, so the schools and the, the tours and stuff is, is the real fun part for me. Oh, what's, Obviously, what's winning's been, okay as well sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What's been, what's been the... <laughs> What's been your best one? What's the what's the met the one place you think, wow, this is amazing? Well, we got the, the, the first we got the tours in in Spain, so you know I've, that's probably the sunshine helps, but you know the the variety of trails and stuff as well. It's always I, I just love riding there, and uh, there you know you're in Spain now, though, Graham, aren't you? Yeah, that's it. We're doing it, checking out the, the trails there, making some new new tracks, bit of training. And then uh, just been to Italy doing a school. So that was cool. And then hopefully, you know, it's difficult to travel at the moment. So I'm kind of just planning short term. But hopefully we've got a, a trip to uh, Paraguay in a few weeks. You know, it's... In, in Italy, is that, have you got a school in Italy then? Or is that just basically somebody else organised it and, and, and you come in and did, did some teaching? Yeah, you know guys just messaged me sometimes this was with uh for solo who did hell's gate so he's got some uh organizational skills uh, i've known him a few years and he just said you know come over the flights are okay so went over good good group of riders you know swiss riders and germans they all came down and we had a good Good time. It's a bit colder than Spain, but <laughs> what, what do you think in terms of like? Because I mean, you know, we touched on social media, obviously rocketing, and you guys like, you know, kind of taking it to the next level. And in all honesty, you've done, you know, the enduro boys do seem to do a better job than the motocross boys in promoting the sport. You know, in all honesty, that's kind of my opinion. Um, and also, I suppose it does show in terms of the amount of following that you guys do get. You get, you, you know. It's insane, but I mean, your bike skills as well are kind of a different level as well, aren't they? Um, unless they look at your channel and just see you wheeling all the time, Graham. Mm. Um, <laughs> no, but what I was, where I was going with it is that what, it, as you're a well-travelled man and you're, look, and you're working with schools, who's, who's new? Who do you think's new is coming up? You know, who's, uh, you know, I suppose two question. Now, have you got your eye on any any youngsters coming up into the sport other than your obviously team? And secondly, like you know, what's kind of where do you see like most of the talent coming from in like which country? Yeah, it seems to be you know the, the British guys, and then you know Spain. Obviously, it's kind of dominating between them countries at the moment. I would say, but uh, you know, this it'd be nice to to help some riders some countries where it's not not such a 
a well organized sport maybe you know a lot of countries they just kind of do they don't have a, so many races and it's more trail riding and stuff so it'd be good to give them the guys the the opportunity to yeah. to come yeah. over and is there anyone in particular that you've seen young like youngster wise <laughs> Uh, yeah, we've got there aren't a few guys. You know, there's a lot of guys. Uh, you see them on the on the social media that they're all doing the tricks and stuff. So I think that's kind of the problem. Everybody can, you know, blip up a step and do do some wheelies and tricks and stuff. But you know, racing is kind of a, a different ball game. So you never know, you know, how how good the the skills or how determined and committed they are. But uh, you know, we're always keeping an eye out. If there's anyone on out there, you know, got the, we're ready. Got the grit and determination. But on, I suppose, like, the next thing is you're doing your own clothing line. We've got to speak a little bit about that, haven't we? I mean, yeah, you know, we give the, give the race gear a plug. Jarvis race gear. Yeah, you've got, you've got a few Two years in development. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yeah, extreme development. You've got um, a few, um, it was it Jarvis School, Jarvis Style. There's a few different Instagrams popping up now, isn't there? Are they, are they all yours? A few hashtags. Yeah, I've, I've developed a few hashtags that seem to, to catch on a little bit. Jarvis Style. Yeah. 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 Uh, Jarvis Basics. Yeah. I like to use them. I, I can't think of anything to say on the, on the social. That's the problem. So I just have to put hashtags. You know, some people like to put a few sentences and stuff, but I just can't... <laughs> Uh, it takes you, too much time trying to think. I get stressed, you, so I just. Well, you, yeah. you've got well, you've got to have the biggest following, so it's worked, doesn't it? Yeah, that's it. I'm not doing too much wrong, so. But I, I enjoy doing the videos as well, so it's all good fun. I'm I'm pretty much done, Adam. Have you got one more, couple more questions? I just, I just want to ask about are there are there any races outside of the Highland Road that you think I'd like to do that? You know, like a like Dakar, like a Dakar, or, like a Dakar. Dakar. Yeah, I have a go at Dakar. Yeah, yeah, it'd be fancy. Yeah, that. I think Dakar is the obvious one. Just to say, you know, just to go there and say I've done it. I'm not sure I'd want to take it too seriously, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's the obvious step. We've got the the Husqvarna is bringing the Northern Adventure bike out, so you know, getting older would be quite nice just to cruise around on that. What? Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> go on. So what? We'll, What's the um? What's what is the main aim then? I suppose we've got to, you know. What's the main aim then for this year? Then what's the what's the goal? What, you know, the obviously the aim is to win Erzberg. Is it? Is that the is that the plan? Yeah, it'd be nice to to beat Taddy's record. We're both on five wins, so and then win the championship in it. I've got to do it. Could be my last chance. Can you I've remember, got to do it. It's simple. Can you remember how many times you've actually won Ersberg, though? You know, can you remember? Can, can you list off your achievements? Here's with your uh, achievements. We can end. Well, no, it's five five Erzbergs and six Romaniacs, and then after that, I kind of get. A, I can never remember, but that's enough, isn't it? Yeah, that's a, that, that is enough. What about trials? Yes, yeah, so I had uh, five British Championship wins. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, four Scottish six days, and then uh, fourth in the world, five individual world round wins. Yeah, well, that was in a different lifetime. That's, I think that's it. We, you know, say no more. On that, that note, on that bombshell. Yeah, yeah. That, just one more thing, then. Just is how many followers you've got on Instagram at the moment? It's it's a million, isn't it, and something. We're out. Go on, introduce. I'm Graham's dad, and mum's downstairs, and I can't ride a motorbike to save my life. <laughs> like that, Graham can. Does it look too big? No, it looks good. It looks good. You're pulling, you're pulling the look off. It's working well. To be fair, you you look a lot better than Graham. I've been talking to Roy Francis in Paul Smarts. I remember him getting a... Uh, a fan tip from Roy Carey to try, a brand new one. And I went down the wood at the back of us at Sturry, in the quarry pits. And I said, oh, let me have a go. So I got on it and I went up the, through the trees in there and I thought it was gonna stop. So I opened it up and it reared up and went round the trees. <laughs> Graham said, hope you ain't damaged my bike, Dad. <laughs> His brother had a, had a motorbike and then Graham said, can he have a go? So I brought this little TY-80 Luckily, where we lived, 
there was a, a wood behind us and we could see it from our kitchen window. And they used to go in there. But we wouldn't let them in there unless they was with someone. So when Graham first started, he used to ride about just where mum could look out the kitchen window and watch him. Push bike, he was always doing wheelies, you know, and he, he'd ride along the four inch wall at the front of the bungalow and get to the end and flip it round and ride back again. <laughs> <laughs> I got it on video, Dad. It's unbelievable, yeah. So so back, so when we've everybody seen the, um, you know, Graham Jarvis in lockdown, uh, you know, playing on his motorbike in the back garden and, and wrecking sheds yes. and, and, yeah. and garden yeah. walls. That's it. That's nothing. That's nothing, that's nothing new. Nothing new. No. And he, I used to have chickens at the bottom of the garden, and he used to ride down a garden path and jump straight up on top of the chicken house with his Monty bike, <laughs> turn around and come back out again. He wanted to ride his push bike, and, and funny enough, the bikes we used to make up for him. He, I got him a brand new tyre and he'd worn it out in a week. And I used to go down, is it Trev's cycles? Yeah, Trev's, yeah. I used to go down there and I said, well, he's worn it out, Trev. No, I don't believe that, he said. I said, well, and I had to buy He went to school. The school was probably a mile and a half away. And if I came home early from work then, I used to go and meet him. And if I went up the road and there was other children coming down the road, I knew I knew I missed him. Because he was the first one out of school. <laughs> this is on it. He came first one out of school and he'd be running down the road and he'd run indoors, get his changed and go out on his bike. Yeah. I knew, you know, as I knew he I missed him. But how he ever got out of school first every time, I never know. But he <laughs> was eighty. Brought it off a chap, I saw it advertised and we brought it off a chap who now uh, road bike tester for Motorcycle News, Michael Guy, and he's, I can't think of his dad's name, but he had a brother and they used to ride trials. And uh, we brought it and his dad had altered all the swinging arm and all that, and that was the first bike he ever rode. The only bike that I ever brought, and since then, he'd been sponsored by uh, Roy Francis in Paul Schmart's Motorcycles. And as I said, I went to try the little Honda 50 and Roy said, well, you can have them if he's, if he likes it, I'll sponsor him for the year. And Roy more or less sponsored him all the time after that. And that was just because of some of the events that he'd been at, was it? It was some yeah, of the trial. Yeah, so saw him riding and he said he's going to be good in the future. Yeah. He said, yeah. So he was right. Last event, we used to, we joined, we didn't even know what Kent Youth Cup Trials Club was it. And we joined that and Barry joined it and, and then... They wouldn't let Graham ride in the adults because he was, uh, but we did eventually go to some because of the insurance, I think it was. And then uh, we went to a few and they let him ride and he started beating some of the adults. And, and I used to say, well, we don't want no trophies, we just come to ride, you know, which we he did. And uh, yeah, and people I see now, they used to say, I still remember you, Cliff. You used to stand about halfway up that hill. He said, Where that little Honda 50 was going to run out of power. <laughs> but he never gave up. He, had, he kept going. Yeah, kept going. Well, yeah. And, and you said about wellies. What was this? And the... he was riding in wellies, then we couldn't afford a ferry. <laughs> yeah. And then Roy sponsored him with boots and hats and what have you. And yeah. then the, we started doing schoolboy nationals then. And. He started doing one or two, he, and he won, he won one or two. And then he won the C class, the B class, the A class. And then of course he wanted to go into the adults as soon as he could. Before he was 14 or 15, Roy Carey, who was the Fantic agent then, said he would sponsor him. And he kept on, he'd sponsor him. And so we went, in the end, we went up and saw Roy in uh, Bromford. I think of the other place where it was, and he, he, we had a word with him, and he said he would sponsor him. But then he also wanted the Fantic Factory to sign him, and he was a still a schoolboy. So they agreed to sign him, and they paid him, I think, two grand then hmm. on the factory contract. I did have the factory contract. Yeah. And in the end, Graham said, I don't want to ride for Fantic. Yeah. For Mark Hicken. 
we went and told Roy, and Roy said, oh, well, he said, I think Mark will be all right in the end, but he said, you know, you've got the contract, he said, you'll have to pay the money back. I said, well, we'll pay the money back then. So we paid it back. Now, we was uh, up in Scarborough for the two-day thing up there, I think, or National, and Malcolm Rhoda Rathmore was there, who was the, was the Aprilia importer then, and, uh, and, and the school bird. And Graham was riding about on his push bike, going over rocks and doing 380s or whatever you call them. And, and Malcolm and Rhoda stood there and they said, cool, I think he's going to be good. So Malcolm got in touch and said, would you know, he'd sponsor him if he wanted to. So he, and he sent a, he said, I'll send a new Aprilla down for you. He said, and yeah, that came. And unbeknown to me, I was at work. And when I came home from work, the bike had been delivered in the cardboard box and Graham had put the handlebars on and whatever was out the box and started it up in the garage. And when I spoke to Mum, she said, I don't know what's going on out there. She said, but it was, she said, I thought it was a lawnmower. She said, making a hell of a noise. She said, and then it stopped. So <laughs> it turned out that uh, he put the handlebars on and the tank or whatever, and uh, trapped the throttle cable underneath somewhere. And he opened it up and because it didn't shut off. And he didn't know how to sh shut it or stop it then. <laughs> and it just went <laughs> and seized up, went bang. <laughs> so I, when I came home, he said, uh, can you ring Malcolm? So I said, what for? He said, the bike seized. So I said, no, you ring Malcolm. So in the end, he, he did ring Malcolm, and Ma Malcolm was with Mick Grant, I think. But I don't know where it was, at Donington or somewhere in, a, in the middle of the track. He said, and, and Malcolm recalled it at Graham's wedding. He said, he said, picked up the phone, he said, Graham here, bike seized. And Malcolm said, in box or out of box? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what he said. And, and then at the time he sent Colin Boniface down the next day with a new bits and rings and, and whatever and they stripped it out. And he got him going. But that's it. That's how yeah, that's a that's good how, Yeah, that's and then he, good. he went and he moved up and lived with Malcolm for oh, ten, fifteen years. I can remember in the schoolboys he was he we used to go to the schoolboy national up in York there. I said, you go all the way up there and he would hardly speak a word. But on the way back, if he won, I couldn't stop him talking. <laughs> and I used to say to him, if you win, we can go, when you come back, we can go in a little chef and you can have what you like to eat. So it cost me a fortune in the end. But, and I can remember going to do the Scott trial and the first time we done, we didn't know anything about the Scott and what have you. And I think Graham finished about seventh or eighth then. And I can remember standing behind Mark Lampkin and he was saying to somebody, and they said, how do you reckon Jarvis to do? And he said, ah, oh, he won't do very good here, he said. He said, he, and he, they go round the rocks here, he said, and we go over them. Yeah. But it, it proved him wrong in the end because Graham actually I don't know whether you know. He's four times, wasn't he? Nine. Nine. He beat yeah. Tammy Miller was the record holder. Eight times he'd won it. And Graham actually still holds it now. He's won it won it nine times. Uh, yeah. Malcolm Rathmore won it four times. I think he was 33 when he decided. Obviously, he'd hurt himself, done his crusade ligaments, and they said he wouldn't ride again. And and then he done he busted his thumb in uh, an indoor trial somewhere. So they flew him home from there and we went up to a, a surgeon in Petersfield Hospital up here who'd done Barry Sheen's legs apparently when he smashed on his bike. And we said next the week after that he had to qualify for the Trials de Nations team and he wanted to ride in it. So we said to the surgeon and he said, well, if you bring a pair of handlebars, he said, I mould the cast so he can grip the handlebar. Actually, he took these handlebars up into Petersfield and they done them. 
and next week he'd done the competition and they qualified for the trials for the nations team and he got about four or five sections to go and I, well, I was there, I saw him, he came out of the section and he, and he just put his foot down and he went round and he twisted his thing, snapped his screw shape ligament and he's actually got back on the bike when you see these footballers rolling about the cruise he actually got back on the bike and rode on one leg and he rode the last four sections and when he got to the end he couldn't get off the bike they had to lift him off the bike he joined the kent youth uh, and then of course you get involved don't you Anne was the secretary and I was a clerk of the course and the assistant clerk of the course and you used to give up your weekends, you know, you go out Saturday, set the course out, you go Sunday again, it might be down in Eastbourne and, and go Sunday and watch it and then you still get people that would moan that it was too hard or too easy. And I used to say, well, if you want it, to, how you want it, come with us Saturday and set it out. Yeah. I don't know where that was. He, he was walking the section and obviously he was moving a few rocks with your feet like you do and, and different things and the observer said to him you want some tarmac down there young man he said and graham spoke went back he said oh, i didn't think they worked on the sunday <laughs> i can't think how old he was yeah <laughs> quite funny isn't it yeah, yeah. It's fu yeah. and he never drunk he never done he wouldn't drink have no drinks or anything and the only time he can ever remember him drinking was when he won the scot and he'd had a few, because Malcolm had his like a few, and he had a bottle in his hand, and then because he won, he had to get up and give a speech. And in the end, the commentator said, oh, can I have the mic back? And he said, no, I haven't finished speaking yet. <laughs> he went on another <laughs> green dad. <laughs> That's the Folkestone man. They used to write, write, do grass track meetings and all that, and then they went into trials. And we got into, we joined the Folkestone Motorcycle Club, and it was more or less in just a trials club. And they had a clubhouse down here in Folkestone. They, used to, they brought it with all the money they made at the grass trade. And then, because it got so expensive, they decided that you know, they would sell the clubhouse and you know, invest the money somewhere, which they did. And at the time, we just started trials then. I think Graham must have been about 11 or 12. And I, funny enough, I was on the committee of the Folkestone <laughs> Motorcycle Club. And, and, they decided that they was paying income tax on the interest with the money what they sold the clubhouse for. So rather than pay the interest, they said they would sponsor Graham with some of the money, the interest, so they didn't pay the tax on it. Good, we're good. Which without, I can honestly say, without motor, folks from Motorcycle Club, he wouldn't have done what he has done now. Yeah. Because they gave him £5,000. Yeah. Which was a lot of money in them days. Yeah. And which I think he's probably still got it now, knowing Graham. <laughs> he wouldn't ever spend it. I had, I, to, I had to spend it. I did, I did say he was tight and he did it. We did say that in his interview. I said, is it all trials riders are tight? Or is it, yeah, but he did. He probably still has got it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that's good, isn't and it? As I, mean, I say, without, without them and Paul, Roy Francis in Paul Smarts, I said he, he couldn't have done what he did. And then, there was another chap, unfortunately he's died now, uh, Dave Jones, who owned Sparshack Mercedes place at Zimbal. I said I was at a trial one day, and I didn't really know Dave, and he was, we was watching, and I, he was doing the pre-65, and I was talking to him, and I said to him, do you do swan, uh, you know, rent bands in... He said, why? I said, well, I've got to go to the YMSA six day. I said, and my other sun rides. I said, I want a big van to take everything in. He said, yeah, we do rent vans. He said, but he said, I could, I'll lend you my demo. He said, I've got five or six demo vans and what have you. He said, you can borrow one of them. So he said, pop up and pick it up. So we went up there. Because he's bumps and shaky burns as well, didn't he? For all. Well, really Shaky was in there one day when we was in there and he, he said, well, he's got Shaky Burns here. He's up in the office with the girls, and he? Shaky was. I can remember that. <laughs> so, so we went and saw him. He said, yeah, yeah. He said, you can have that for a week. So uh, we had it for a week. Didn't charge anything, which you can't believe these days. And then when we took it back, 
He said, yeah, yeah, any time you want one. He said, just give us a ring. He said, I'll arrange one for you. So we did that. And then one day we went up there. And he said, uh, I'm getting a bit fed up with you coming in here every week, Cliff, or every other weekend. He said, do it. He said, come with me. And he said, we went round the back. He said, oh, there's a van. We used to call it Big Bertha, this old Mercedes van. He said, you can have that. He said, and do... He said, I'll tax it and insure it and maintain it. And he said, and he said you can kit it out in the back to how you want. Which, nice. Which we did, yeah. I couldn't believe it. I said, without, without Dave and, and what have you. I'm very friendly with Dave. He, well, yeah. And I, I said, we were talking to Dave, and, and he, I said about putting his name on it. And he said, no, I don't want my name. He said, don't tell people I sponsor you. He said, I don't want, because he said, I'll have everybody come here. Can you sponsor my son? You know, my son. He, said, he said, no, I don't want to know. I think for 10, 15 years, his name was never met. We never mentioned his name. And he sponsored Graham right up. Well, before Graham could drive, that was, he used to give him this fan. And then he started doing the European rounds. And we had to get somebody who could drive to go with him. But his older brother actually drove it some of the time. And then another chap, John Martin, he used to drive. And... So he did, yeah. And he, Dave sponsored him right up till he was about 28, 29 with vans. You got to give him a new Sprinter van. Nice. Yeah, and then he gave, he said, oh, I think he'd been onto Mercedes, and he gave, he said, oh, you don't want to drive that all the time. He said, you'd nip around. He said, there's a Vito as well, so he gave him a bit. And I used to say to Graham, do you realise how lucky you are to have people like that? He said, yeah. When... We went out to Spain for Christmas, where he lives now, or, you know, out there. And I said, I stood there with him, and I said, did you ever imagine this would turn out like this? And he said, no. He said, I'm still living a dream now. Good. Mm. That's good. I reckon that'll do us. <laughs> Look at that. You're yeah, all, you're, no, you're going to choke it up. Remembering. <laughs>